Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Kashif Booth Podcast. If you're new here, each week I sit down with a guest. We discuss their career so far, the highs, the lows and what's next for them. Today's guest is Anthony Vander. He is a director from London. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Kashif. How are you, man? How are you doing? It's hot. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, once this is over, I'm going home and the fan's going to be on all day. (laughs) So that's how I'm feeling. How are you? It is hot. It is hot. Um... (laughs) I'm loving it though. I'm loving it. I know it's gonna. The temperature is rising. Um, it's not gonna get. It's not gonna get any colder. But um, yeah. No, I'm doing really well. Thank you. I'm doing really well. So, uh, so this is a lovely space we're in. And yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm really looking forward to to this. Good. Good. So, well, yeah. Anthony is best known for his feature film Sweet Boy, which premiered at the American Black Film Festival, which is arguably the biggest black film festival in the world it's oscar and bafta qualifying he's also well known for his film spa which is on uk fully focus mm. and recently his film finale which he shot last year so yeah it is good to meet anthony for like the third time in person because <laughs> funny story <laughs> we've known each other for four years and yeah i think it's just for the industry like you just connect oh this is a filmmaker blah 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 you see each other's work you're fans of each other's work and then you just never meet or you're like, oh, wow, at an event. hundred percent. Yeah, that's just how it goes. Yeah. So we've only met this year in person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is very Which strange. is interesting because it's it's so weird. I think when we first met, which was at um, Pitch House Central, mm-hmm. it was, it, it almost felt like I'd known you for a very long time, which I have, but also in person. Yeah. And I have that sometimes with a lot of my high school friends. Like we speak every day through WhatsApp, but we don't entirely see each other. But when we do, it just, you know, it feels like second nature. Yes. So yes, yes. Yeah. I totally understand that. I totally understand that. So yeah, so that's that's just our story. I mean, I've had many stories like that. Like even the creator of Tally versus Serafina, mm. I've known her for years, but I didn't know her. So <laughs> basically like we share a mutual cousin. Yeah. And she was at loads of family events and stuff like that. And every time I saw her, I was like, I don't know you. And she was like, we've Got met you. before. So it took years for me to remember who she was. So mm-hmm. yeah, so it just it just kind of happened. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah. So you're a director. Mm. So how long have you been directing? Like, how did you get started? Um, I started around 2011. So I shot my first short film that year. It was... I mean, fast, you know, going backwards in time, I had a background in acting. I trained as an actor at a school that no longer exists. It's called Drama Centre London. Um, many a name kind of went there. Um, so, yeah, I did a lot of theatre, did a lot of um, short films, um, web series, TV. And I just kind of got the knack for directing because I directed a show I initially wrote a play um, that I put on in a theatre pub called The Old Red Lion in Angel. Um, And yeah, from there, I sent it to the National Youth Theatre back in 2010. And yeah, they they responded to me and said they want to put on for rehearsed reading, which really gave me a confidence boost at the time because writing wasn't something that was, you know, came easily um and i never i'd never written a play before and then that play inhibitions and studio 66 studio 66 primarily i wrote those two plays and ended up directing one at the old red lion and also the roundhouse and then yeah it just came about the actors said that they loved um the way in which i worked with them as a director um I was hands-on, but also the idea of willing to kind of um, share and make it not just individ- me as the individual director, share our own kind of collaborative creative process. And yeah, from there, I kind of got the knack for directing because I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed um, kind of constructing and working with actors um outside of you know being 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 the actor you know working from i say behind the camera but this was theater 
<laughs> but yeah, from there, I kind of wrote a short film called Hooligan and that got into the short corner at Cannes Film Festival. We made that for £300. Wow. Didn't know about, you know, things like the gaffer, <laughs> second aid. I just thought initially that you turn up with a camera, <laughs> you know, sounds included, you know, there's no, you know, recording sound externally, sounds included and... You just you just make a film, which primarily it can be because it's you know there's always different formats of filmmaking, but there's so much more technical elements you know as you know, and it's just from there I just got the knack, and that's that's yeah that's how I got started with directing, um, and then yeah from short corner in Cannes I went out to Cannes, established you know a small community of filmmakers or a big community of filmmakers, and then and I didn't look back from there. That's really good. That's yeah. really good to hear your journey, especially yeah. because you started off as an actor and then to fall into directing like that. Mm. And I feel like you definitely have a knack for directing because we'll get into this later. But when we did our research and development for the film Stag we're developing, you know, really seeing you in action was really good because you were able to give notes and feedback and all the actors were able to take constructive feedback and know how to implement the notes you're giving them and that's a very important because some people just don't take direction well and you have a way of being able to clearly state what you want them to do and mm -hmm. they're able to register it and do it mm -hmm. and that's the difference between me because I would I don't like directing I don't <laughs> think I'm a director I know I'm not a director but I can see the differences because directing is a talent and it's mm -hmm. something that not everybody has you know mm -hmm. and that's what I can see definitely within your style and what you've what you've done in the past mm -hmm. as well. I think I think um, it's the idea of just being open and transparent. So I know you say like you're not a director, but it's the idea of you're you're a great communicator as well. And I think that is the um, primarily that is one of the most important things you need um to take on a role such as that and and you have that so it's I, I i personally feel like everyone has the ability to direct um you know if you're if you're creative it all just comes down to you know you know communicating verbally non-verbally and and sharing and putting your ideas across um but no, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank no, you. No, that's all right. Because um, I was going to ask you, so when it comes to directing, so let's say you are auditioning for a film. Mm. So let's say beyond the self-tapes and you're like in the callbacks with an actor, what are you looking for? What what stands out to you in terms of how they are portraying the character? Or are you looking for how well they take direction? What are you looking for? Oh, that's a really good question. It's a, it's a lot of that. It's all meshed in. It's it's almost like cooking. It's all meshed in with the ingredients. I'm looking for how they respond to direction. Um, but I think with a lot of acting, it's the idea of, yeah, as the actor, you take that direction. But that does, for me personally, and every director is different, that just doesn't mean that that's set in stone. Um, so if I, if I give you the direction of picking up a, a, a coffee cup, yeah, well, me as the director, I want you to follow that direction of picking up a coffee cup, but you need to attain that to, you know, the thoughts, the feelings, the action, the objective, and more, you know, take it beyond the note that's just been given. So, I mean... I want the actor to be intentional and further the direction, but I also, it's also about, you know, whether they're able to, taking direction is about response. Mm -hmm. It's about, it's about whether, you know, th there's an energy that can make that, that the actor is adaptable, that they're able to make the adjustments, um, that they're, that they can work as a team, um, but yeah, it's it's also about for me. I'm I'm not. I mean, I'm a director. I I write a little bit, but in terms of the script, I'm happy for them to improvise if it creates a free flow. Free flow if it creates a relaxation. Um, so yeah, I'm just looking for that. I always say energy, effort, attention. 
them taking it to that next level, being bold, being daring, taking risks. Um, and that has many different you know, nuances and, you know, what does that mean? It just means investigating more, being playful and enjoying, you know, every, you know, it's not the idea of I have to have this role, I have to have to enjoy doing what you're doing because more than often, you know, if an actor turns up to an audition, there might be those nerves and it's like the nerves should serve the adrenaline. Mm -hmm. um, but also it's that idea of, the adrenaline, within that adrenaline should be enjoyment. It should be an enjoyment that this is your craft, this is your bread and butter. And and I always want every actor that I work with to win. I want every creative that I work with to win, you know? Um, and yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much the basis of that. As, as long as they know that and have that self-talk, then then I'm more like more than likely to work with them. I like that. I like that. Because you made a good point, especially when I used to direct, I used to allow the actors to improv and really take mm. on the character in the way they've interpreted them because they have more of a connection to the characters than I do because they're literally playing the character, you yeah. know? So yeah, yeah. I like sometimes their interpretation of it. And if I don't like it, I will then give them the notes as to, okay, I need you to pull it back or go in this direction. Mm. And I think... Me as a writer, when I used to write and I'm getting back into writing, I used to be able to then write the scripts in a way of that I know this particular actor will deliver it in that way. Mm. So then I won't need to give them as much notes because they'll get it. And that was really cool. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. There's, there's nothing um, more kind of exciting than the penny drop moment mm -hmm. for when you're working with an actor, when you give them those notes and it's the idea of just that idea sinks um, and they get it um, because I, I believe those penny drop moments aren't just, they don't just exist for the actor, but they exist for the creative. Um, and when it's shared and when it's collaborative, it's just exciting. It's just really kind of fulfilling, exciting. There's a lot of joy in there um, and it's fun. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And because most people to like the, average person they don't really know what a director does so when you when I think about directing because I work with directors all the time it's mm. not just directing the actors but it's you know the shot list it's the <laughs> working with the director <laughs> of photography it's location yeah. it's working with art department wardrobe so <clears throat> can you break down in a summary or the way you know the full role of a director and how important they are to a production Mm. Oh, that's a that's a very good question, and I, I'm thinking as well. Mm. I'm getting these as you said. That I'm getting <laughs> I'm getting like these flashbacks yes, of like previous exactly. projects. Um, it I think it starts with the creative vision. Mm -hmm. um, what you kind of and, and with this, I I just finished this book about you know the starving artist uh, versus the thriving artist, and it talks about the. Um, the thriving artist steals and it's the idea of it's 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 not uh, stealing in a way that kind of just copying what you see but it's almost like you steal because you're inspired from what you see and you further it so i be why i say that is because the idea of that creative vision is your for me, primarily with just say something like Stag, there's a lot of influences, mm -hmm. um, you know, such as Halloween, such as Midsummer. Um, so in terms of the creative vision, I always kind of think and like steal from other films and almost put, you know, my own kind of spin on it, which is um, very character driven, um, kind of naturalistic. Some could say like social realism. So creative vision um, and communicating that to the DOP um, with regard to, you know, different shot selections. I like to do my own shot lists. Um, the recce, you know, visiting locations, um, mapping out, you know, how the shot best serves the environment and you know which one is placed at the foreground or the background because I always believe like a the environment is an extra character as well um and then yeah just commute 
in terms of it, it's like communicating your ideas to mm-hmm. actors, <laughs> to your whole department. So I always think of it as being almost um, a a manager, um, but also like an, the HR department because like you're juggling you yes. know, different personalities, <laughs> different individuals. Um, and then, yeah, from there, it's just the idea of um, talking to, you know, composer, finding out what the score is um, and, you know, putting it to fruition, storyboarding. So, yeah, that's all those things I've talked about pre-production and then production is, you know, dele- you know delegating um being, you know, adaptable, um, directing actors, talking to your first, your second AD, uh, continuity. So, yeah, I'm making it sound like, I hope I'm not making it sound like a chore because it is really exciting. But um, but a lot of work goes into a, this. A lot of work goes into it. Um, but I think in order to, you know, fulfil anything, you uh, and make it to the standard that you want, it's going to require that work. Um, but yeah, a lot of work does go into being a director. Um, but I, I, I like to call it worthwhile work. Um, yeah. I like that. You mentioned a lot of references in terms of like different creative visions mm. of who you look to. So who are some of your favourite directors or favourite films? Uh, Steve McQueen mm. um, is, for me... I, I put him in most probably my top five of all time. I just think shame, um, hunger, 12 years is, you know, he's, he's in terms of his kind of, um, and what he's done, you know, what he's done recently uh, with the BBC. It's just, his visual storytelling is on another level. It feels, it, it almost feels... Um, it's like art, and yeah, he's an artist. I think Andrea Arnold and the way she incorporates improvisation. Um, think about films like Red Road, uh, American Honey. Um, and then, yeah, Scorsese, mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, just the way that he gets these performances out of his actors, the visual storytelling, the music, mm-hmm. which um, which isn't talked about, I don't think, enough in the editing. And then, yes, Spielberg for excitement, for you know when you're going to see a Spielberg film that you are going to, you need to get the popcorn ready. You, the juices are going to get flowing. Um, and then Spike Lee again for, Spike Lee for just energy, music, um, the style, his cinematic style, um, I just think is beautiful. So, yeah, those are... Those are the those are the influences, um, and 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 many more. I, I'm influenced by a lot of creatives around me as well, and a lot of filmmakers around me. Um, so yeah, like those are the names. But uh, when I think about the names, like you know, in this country, such as like Thomasin mm-hmm. Adapuju, mm-hmm. um, Remy Moses, who's currently studying, but he's 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 an inspiration. Um. Yeah, the Talia Versus, the oh. director of Talia Versus. Just there's so many. There's so, like, I, do you know what this whole podcast? Could just, <laughs> this whole podcast is just gonna be me talking about my inspirations for like two hours, and I could do it. I could do it. I understand that. Yeah, I, I definitely feel like I'm inspired and like pushed by my peers as well. Like you, everybody around yeah. me, just seeing what everybody else is doing, mm. it just ignites a fire that, yes, I'm inspired. I want to create more. I want to do more. So mm. I totally understand that. And because we're all in the same journey, we you know we're all on the same path. We're all trying to get to another level and, mm. and stuff like that. So that's Yeah, really cool. yeah, 100%, yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. So back in 2014, you released Sweet Boy. So mm. how did that come about? That's your debut feature film. Mm. You know, you self-funded that. So mm-hmm. yeah, and self-funding is tough. So like, <laughs> tell us about it. Like, how did you come up with the idea? Or oh, I think you work with Joe Harvey on that yeah. as well. So yeah, tell us about the whole journey of that. So initially, Sweet Boy was meant to be a short film. Um, I was very much influenced by that whole idea of um, just like the thriller genre 
um, a lot of like David Fincher films um, where you may have like your anti-hero. So just say a film like The Game with Michael Douglas, where um, it's like this idea of, you know, to kind of quote the title, a game's being played on him and all these things are happening around to him, around him and to him um, that he's not necessarily in control of. Um, so I was influenced by that. I was influenced by Alfie and that kind of the male, not necessarily like the, yeah, the, the protagonist, um, and this idea of, you know, almost like the chickens coming home to roost, like all these, uh, this, this, this adversity and these obstacles just really affecting that character arc. Um, so with that idea, I kind of presented it to Joe Harvey. I, I said, if you think about films like Mo Better Blues, where you've got, you know, kind of the smooth, charming protagonist who um, it kind of, he, you know, the, the, um, the actions almost come um, and, you know, I wouldn't say like the sins, but the actions um, are really kind of questioned and confronted um, and, you know, the Annie heroes put on the spot. So I kind of presented that idea to Joe Harvey, um, who's the writer that, that I'm collaborating with with on Stag. And it was initially meant to be a short um, kind of revenge based thriller. Um, and kind of like the log line is a married man who cheats on his wife um is given an ultimatum by his four girlfriends that's like the the basic log line and and yeah from there i just decided i made two choices right because i wasn't meant i wasn't meant to act in it i acted in it as well so that was one of the first choices the second choice is it was that it it wasn't going to be a short it was going to be a feature i was like why not why not there's so many fi- like when i go to the cinema i'm watching features uh, more so than shorts, why not just take a leap? <laughs> and, and boy, did I not know what kind of leap that was because just working on a feature is just, it's just so much. It's so much, as you know, like kind of just the magnitude of it, the time, the hours, like 14, 15 hour days, um, the yeah, the budget, um, just goes. I remember with the first day of shooting, the budget went within the first day. Wow. And yeah, yeah. And just things, because I, I think as well, like it was a very, the growth um, and the lessons that I learned was just trying not to take on everything myself. Um, I don't have any regrets. Um, I don't necessarily believe in regrets, but if there was something that I would have made the adjustment to, I wouldn't have acted in it. I would have delegated more because I was trying to do everything. I acted, mm. I directed, I produced it. Um, so like whilst I was acting in a scene, whilst directing a scene, the actors were also asking me like, we're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know? wow. Yeah, so yeah. you know what I mean? So I was just like, um... And then I had a, I had a really good team and that they got me through it. If, if I didn't have a really good team, I'm talking about the actors, um, you know, the DOP primarily, Ian Code, who's, I just think the most, one of the most, if not the most amazing DOP lives out in LA. He's, LA, he's working out in LA now, but it's just, yeah, they got me through it and I learned a lot, but um, that feature came about, it was meant to be a short, I said to Joe, um, let's make it a feature. I'm going to act, direct, produce it. And yeah, that's kind of how we, how we kind of got rolling with it. But yeah, it was, it was a workout. It was a journey full of adversity. Um, yeah. I can imagine. I mean, what was your initial budget and what did you get to? (laughs) The initial budget was nothing. Okay. Right. Okay. And um the budget we got to was about eight thousand okay yeah and um how we got that budget my my family helped me like my mum was really really supportive as was my dad um but i also worked four jobs at the time wow i was working as um an usher I was working at, as a cinema usher. 
I was working as a teaching assistant, I was doing flyering, and I was also an actor. So I used those sources of income to, to, fund, this, to fund this project. Um, and I remember being on the train when I was doing a recce with the DOP, Ian, and Ian was like, by the way, uh, Anthony, uh, what's, your, what's your budget? <laughs> and I just remember, I just remember going silent <laughs> because at that time there was no budget. <laughs> So, I mean, part of it was just like, I hate to use the word, but there was part of me that was winging it um, whilst working really, really hard, but just praying every night, hoping that, you know, money would appear because money just, on a feature, money disappears because the time is just, it's so tight. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that that was that was the budget around eight thousand. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can relate to everything you're saying because I've been there. You're, mm. it's not like you don't have a budget. Yeah, but you're not. You don't have a figure in your mind as to okay, this is how much I want to spend on it. Yeah. Uh, when you're making it in that type of way, like a, a project, you're not really gonna say, okay, I'm only gonna spend this amount of money. You can't, you know, because you don't have somebody else's money. You mm. know, you've got your own money to like yeah, put in this. Yeah, yeah. So you're not thinking, okay, I just want to spend this much. Mm. No, you're not thinking about that. You're just literally, okay, I have a figure in my head and this mm. is how much I want to spend and I'm <laughs> gonna spend this much. Yeah, That's yeah, how yeah, I yeah, had yeah, to yeah. do literally everything. And you know what? Do you know what? So to interrupt, the funny thing is, is that the things like seeing how you put together budgets and just seeing, you know, looking on like templates and pre uh, budgets of like, you know, other films. And it's just, my budget was a really basic budget. And it also was like determined that everything would go right, that we would be wrapped within like eight hours. <laughs> it's just the idea of, no, this, this isn't how it works. The, the eight hour days were like 14 hour days. Um, food, you know, drink. I, I had to, some of the, you know, um, camera department were coming from outside of London. So I had to put them up in hotels and it was no. just, it was just a madness. <laughs> um, equipment, like we had the insurance. Um, and then I remember like something, we didn't fill out something correct. And then one of the pieces of equipment broke and we weren't we didn't have the insurance for it even though we'd taken out insurance and it was just it was a bit of a nightmare uh with those things also i had one of one of the actors i've told this story many a time one of the actors uh was also one of the drivers so we were filming in north devon wow um yeah we really wanted to get that like countryside um beach kind of you know, that, like that visual that mm -hmm. is going to, you know, up the budget more, which it did. Um, but yeah, we stopped off at a petrol station and he was the driver, Joseph. Love him. In incredible guy. Um, <laughs> and we were all like drinking coffees. It felt like a time that me as a director, I felt like I'd got a grasp of what I was doing. And we were coming together more as a team. And then like he runs out, he went to use a toilet and he runs out and he's, his hands are all wet. And he's like, the keys, the keys, the keys. I was like, I, I was just like, what are you doing? I thought he, I thought he was going, losing, losing it. And he had dropped the keys down the toilet. No. Yeah. So this van that we had hired um, to transport everyone from London to North Devon, which is a four hour drive. So we had stopped at this kind of, petrol station shop, shopping center two hours away and yeah he just he ended up um dropping the keys down the toilet <laughs> and that was like 600 to a thousand pounds just gone right there and then because someone on a motorbike had to like transport had to get a new set of keys and they also had to drive two hours two hours out of london and i remember at that point i actually wanted to give up i just i said to joseph um once he got the new set of, he got the new set of keys and we started driving to north devon at like really late we'd lost the whole day of, of shooting. course i'm sure <laughs> of course and i was just like look let's just cancel today let's just let's just stop and i remember joseph saying to me he was like no i'm gonna drive to north devon we're gonna do this so I mean, the, I mean, the more of that story is about budget, but it's also about, you know, sometimes, sometimes your team carry you, you yeah. know, as much as it's all about the director carrying the team, 
sometimes it's, it's a collaborative being a creative is a collaborative process yes yeah <laughs> i mean you know what like listening to that like i can relate so much like on yeah. this podcast i've really spoken a lot about my project newlyweds a lot yeah because that was hell like that was, yeah, yeah, that, that was hell. Yeah, yeah. It's um, so weird because watching it, I'm just like, this is beautiful. This is like fun. <laughs> this is joke. So you know, you just wouldn't know. You like, don't know. Like it yeah. was four years in the making to do that. Yeah. And coincidentally, that week, I actually did a podcast episode on this. I shot another project the same week, so I shot two projects in one week. Oh wow! For another production company, I was producing, and literally leading up to it, it was just like. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Like budget was out the window. We mm. didn't have enough money. It was just, I literally sat there like, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> like Jeez. literally. And then <laughs> everyone, the team around me were like, no, you can do it. We can do this. We can yeah. do that. And I'm just like, it's, we can't afford to make this. Like we just literally cannot afford to make the series. Yeah. And it took me a while. And I think it's just how my mind works. I think it takes me a while to kind of, maybe it's just my producer brain. Mm. It took me a while. And then, it clicked and I was like, ah, okay, we can do it in the pilot form and we can combine two episodes. And then we really worked with the script and mm. the director literally, not physically, but tore the script in pieces and really changed, rechanged it. We did loads of rehearsals to really make it flow. So we put in so much time and effort just to get it to where it was. Mm. So we could be like at least happy with it. And then that's why we spent eight months in the edit as well. Because it needed to be like, we had a lot of cuts and edits as well. We was not happy with it for a while. Mm. So yeah, so it's just like, that is filmmaking. And it's particularly independent filmmaking. Because when you don't have that money, and you don't have the money, like millions of pounds Mm. to make it, then there are shortages. You know, you don't have Mm. just the access to everything. But then when you do work on you know, major productions. Like I've worked at ITV Studios. I've, I currently work at advertising now. And like, when you see the budgets, they're mad. Like I just did my <laughs> first commercial mm. uh, for Cadbury and the budget was like 95K. Um, and they were like, oh, yes, that's low budget. This is not a big... I was like, sorry? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <was like, laughs> uh, excuse me? <laughs> like, I was so confused. <laughs> what do you mean? This is low budget. And then for what we did... um you would not think it would have cost 95 grand to make that advert. Like it was out on the streets talking to people. You would not think that cost 95 grand. Where's all the money going? But you know what it is because, because there's APA rates. So that's what you, the industry standard is, right? And it's, those rates are mad. Like first ADs can get like paid like a grand just for one day. And I was like, (laughs) I'm really not in the right industry (laughs) because I was like, sorry, like what's going on? So the budgets are crazy. Like they're just completely different. So those are industry hours. And so, you know, so that's where the money comes from brands because you know what it's like, they're making so much money, these Mm. brands. So literally that 95K is nothing Mm. to them really. So that's the difference between film because we're talking about, you know, how you make film and stuff like that. But people... I was trying to break this down to my colleague the other day, actually, of like Mm. how when we do budgets in film, we're just budgeting for that. And then that's it. Mm. Like Literally, there's no like, (laughs) like they were showing me like, okay, when we finish with the budget now, we have to wreck the budget and we have to show off how we make money from it. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about because we aren't making any money from the film we put out unless we have a distribution deal. Like we don't have any money coming back. So... When we're budgeting and getting quotes, we're literally making sure this stays within it. We don't have the money, unless it's a set major productions, you have the money to be able to like pay people overtime and stuff. No, like we're keeping it (laughs) within. We finish at eight, we're finishing at eight. Like that's it. So that's the difference. It's the industry standard. Yeah, completely different. And so I just wanted to say like, in terms of like newlyweds, newlyweds, so watching that and seeing you know, the production value and just, like, that growth and, like, the amazing acting and the, mm. the directing and the music, and which I loved. Isn't that... That is part and parcel. I mean, obviously, like I was saying, I wouldn't have known... If I didn't know you, I wouldn't have known about your struggle with it. Mm-hmm. And I'm learning new things as you say that. But 
isn't that part and parcel? For me, there's a, a beauty and a romanticism that, and I kind of need to kind of unlearn this because it's not always going to serve me. It will serve me as a creative, but not as an entrepreneur. And it's just the idea of, I believe there's so much beauty in that struggle. Like the idea of you saying, I'm not sure if I can do this, having that adversity, and then your team going to, you, no, we can do this. And then the penny dropping for you saying, yes, I can do this. Man, I believe there's so much beauty in that more than a Cadbury advert that doesn't look like the production <laughs> value of, of what it represents. I mean, what the flip side of that is, is that people are being paid what they deserve. And also there's a financial literacy to it. But I don't know. It's weird when you weigh it up because if I think Cadbury's advert, yeah, you're going to get paid more. You're going to earn more versus newlyweds, which is like... It's, it's, a it's a passion project and it's something that enables growth and it's more connective and it, it has a community and audience, then I'm going to choose newlyweds every time. No, I agree because Cadbury pays the bills. And yeah. for me, like I worked in this industry for like professionally eight mm. years and I've worked across factual TV, scripted, broadcast and now advertising. So I like to get all different aspects of the industry to understand it. Yeah. Um. So it's, yeah, it's cool. Like, you know, this helps pay the bills. Like the rates are amazing. But like my main goal is to do newlyweds, you know, mm. to be, make my own projects and be able to, yeah, my execute my vision and yeah. the stories that I want to tell. So that makes it worth it. Yes, you're cussing and you want to... Look, I was this close. <laughs> you can't see, guys, but I'm showing Anthony. I was this close to swinging on people. But I didn't. That was growth for me. Yeah. I didn't touch anybody. However... It's all back. Yeah, yeah. It's all back. So, but in the end, like, when people watch it and it's out, I'm happy with mm. it. I'm able to enjoy the festival run it's in now. Yeah. And yeah, that's yeah, that's which what I want to do. Congrats with that. I'm seeing well, a lot you. of that. So, I'm yeah, seeing a so, lot of the festivals. Yeah, and that's what makes it worth it. Like, mm. these are my children. Like, every time I think of my projects, they're my kids. So it's mm. like, yeah, blood, sweat and tears went in it and it's worth it at the end. And we, we tell these stories because people like to romanticize film and it's like yes, yes it looks really cool but there's so much work what goes into this like you guys work in your nine to five like yeah, that's sweet and all but literally we're like literally 12 <laughs> 14 hour days like you know working really late and stuff like and dealing with a lot sometimes and so it is worth it but mm. it's just yeah we're creative so we're not going to do anything else like so <laughs> we just yeah. kind of put up with it so and i guess that that does work um, on the higher end scale as well with regard to you see a lot of actors and filmmakers they have their passion projects and then they have you know that a booking advert or you know an, yeah. a an advert that's paying the bills yeah um so yeah. yeah yeah no because these look those advertising budgets yeah these actors get paid good money okay mm -hmm. Especially like a usage fee, like, you know, like once it's in syndication for like two months, they're still getting a check for that. So, yeah, so it's worth it. But then what's your craft? What's your passion? Do you want to be an adverse actor or do you yes. actually want to be an actor actor? Yeah. What fuels your passion and what you actually want to do and your highlights your talent, you know, because acting is such an amazing talent. You know, I don't think people realize like you've been able to portray different characters like and different human beings and personality types is great like you know some people might say oh they're just playing a version of themselves yes playing a version of yourself is still acting yes. like it's not as easy as it looks you know so even if somebody is playing the same type of character that's great because they know how to tap into that so, mm. so yeah yeah no 100 percent, 100 percent. so so yeah so moving on Let's talk about Stag. We mentioned it briefly uh, earlier in this podcast episode, but you know, Stag is the horror film which Anthony pitched to me. I think he pitched it to me in November, but I was so busy. I was like, I think I took ages to read the script. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And like, because you've been, we've been trying to work together for a while and you've been pitching yes. to me for a while, actually. Yeah. And because we did apply for BFI London last yeah. year, but we didn't get it, unfortunately. But yeah, yeah. So yeah, tell us about Stag. Like, yeah. So in terms of Stag, the the initial idea came um, 
I was really, I mean, it's taken on so much shape and so much growth. Initially, I had an idea of a one-shot um, horror. So initially, it was going to be a one-shot horror. Um, I'd watched Victoria maybe a couple of days ago. Um, Boiling Point, I was just influenced by that kind of narrative form of storytelling and I kind of presented the idea to Joe um, because I know Joe is a massive, he's he's big on his horrors um, in terms of his slashes. Horror's taken a form of itself, you know. Um, and through that, he also presented the idea of it's, 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 it's going to be too much. Why not just make this... Um, a feature that isn't it that isn't one shot that you have a couple of days to work with um it will make it easier with regard to the story that i'm trying to tell and kind of i yielded to that and it's i mean in terms of stag i was, I was heavily influenced by midsummer um ari aster's film um and what what the kind of log line is is it's a, a stag do with kind of innocent-ish intentions. It's kind of, you know, a stag do doing what kind of stag do does, which is like drinks, fun, um, profanity, um, a bit of wildness. And yeah, it's just gate crashed by a, <laughs> a wolf mask maniac. Mm-hmm. Um but that's kind of like the basic premise, but of around that and the layers within that, it's the idea of, you know, what, you know, the idea of what a stag do is. And I want to be impartial of what it perpetuates because a lot of people think it perpetuates toxic masculinity. Um, but in fact, it's a stag do is something that's originated from you know, ancient Greece and Sparta times. And it was almost like a pre-wedding celebration. So it's just the idea of, yeah, it's it's a fun-fueled British slasher. And, you know, we're we're in that process of development and Joe is just, you know, the script is growing day by day, Mm -hmm. like, as you know. Um, And... Yeah, from there, it was, obviously, I contacted you because I've, mm-hmm. I've wanted to work with you for years and years. And, and yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's pretty much the premise of it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, we can't give too much away. So yeah, yeah. That's I'm, why I'm, I'm, tra- I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> because one thing yeah. I like about Stag and when I was like just creating loads of pitch documents and really just looking at it, it's like the potential it has for being a franchise like Halloween, Scream, mm. Friday the 13th, like yes. all of these iconic, think of like those iconic villains, like, you know, Freddy Krueger, the Scream mm. Mask, you know, Saw films, like there's, it has the potential of that. And oh, I think 100%. That's why I was drawn to it a lot. And I like slasher films anyway. Like yeah. when it comes to horror, I like slasher. I don't care about those stupid ones with like, the evil spirit and oh, yeah, I'm, to, I'm like please listen just shoot the bitch and then she's done, like i just i can't yeah but i think yeah, we discussed yeah, this before like how i can enjoy a horror film and not root for the characters like yeah. i don't care if you live or don't okay. um but i just enjoy a good slasher because it it feels very realistic mm. like i feel like that's what scares me because serial yeah. killers exist you know like mm. and then it kind of reminds me of like zombies i feel like zombies freak me out because look you don't know what could happen yeah that i feel like that's realistic yeah, some yeah, people yeah. may think i'm crazy but like that's what draw me to that's yeah. what drew me to stag because of that and joe's such a great writer so yeah. you know reading the script was very easy yeah, yeah, yeah i mean the earlier draft anyway but like you know the pacing is great the characters are you know the, our characters are great 
outlined really good mm. within the script as well. And I was like, okay, I really see the potential. In it. And that's the thing, working on the script is not just, you know, okay, we're giving feedback, but we're really developing the characters and really pushing Joe as a, a writer to yeah. really get the best out of it. And I don't think people realise how much development goes into it because, you know, you're giving feedback, I'm giving feedback, and we're, we're you know, really kind of trying to mould the story into something. Mm. Just like when I read it to you and I said to you, it's great. Mm. And I know you wanted it you wanted it to be like a diverse cast and I said, but also I'm like white men. And I remember yeah. <laughs> And I wasn't saying that like in a bad way. Yeah, but yeah, like, no, I got it. I totally yeah. got it. And it's like totally no it. disrespect to Joe, but he's yeah. right from his own experiences 100%. and who he is. So it's like if we're gonna diversify the cast, we're gonna need to bring some Seasoning. different Yeah. Exactly. I was going to say different different flavoring, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, and then when we did this research and development with, mm. you know, the diverse cast that you had in mind, like with Anissa, who's Indian mm. and, you know, David, who's black. And yeah. I think, what's your other friend's name? Matthew? Is uh, it? Nathaniel. That's it. Nathaniel. Tom, yeah. 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 And Nathaniel's mixed as well. I think yeah. He's half. Chinese. Yeah. Chinese. So it really fit the vision, what you um, had set in stone. And so once I saw it and heard it, I was like, yeah, this is amazing. Mm. And this is what... I was really excited because I could hear what I've read come to life and then yes. you really see the potential of it. And that's the great thing about taking your time with film. Yes, we've shared our experiences of how we've had limited budgets and we've had to just pull things together, but we still take that time and effort to get to where it needs to be. And yeah. as long as I always say to people, forget about the production quality. As long as the content's good, then people will like it if it's bad quality and bad content then you're in trouble you know like, so yeah. that's the, that's the yeah. thing so what well, people expect you to always grow and we know you're going to get there anyway so that's the great thing i think where we are now because when you came to me you said okay you want to get funding you want to do this you want to get investors i was like great because i'm in that same position i've done what i needed to do to establish who I was, mm. who I am, I should say. And that's got me into crazy rooms because of what I've done. And yeah. likewise yourself as well. So now we're in that place where we should be getting the money we deserve. We should 100%. be getting, yeah, getting into the rooms through this type of quality work. We're, put, we're pitching and developing like that. So that's what's great about growth, I feel yeah. like as well. And now we're in that space. Yeah. So, you know, we've got Kia, who's an amazing script editor, Incredible. who works, you know, for BFI and does all the consultancy and stuff like that. So it's like growing like that. And again, it's because I met him through what I've done and we connected. That's just how it grows. And you, the people gravitate towards you, even if you don't have this money now, because they see the potential of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what's great about where we are now. Yeah. So stay tuned, guys. You yeah. Because uh, that's coming soon. <laughs> Once we get like, hey, I mean, at least a hundred grand. Because yeah, I want oh. at least a hundred thousand. Because we're not doing the eight grand Anthony did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, those, those eight grand days are no, over. No, you. Nah, eight yeah. grand probably is like the director fee. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so like literally. So so yeah. So we're excited for that, and like I think you'll probably hear a lot more of that process as we continue this podcast and just like different elements i'll probably have you back on to just discuss like 100 steps because i think it would be good for people to listen and understand how you can get something from script to screen you mm. know it takes ages i said it took four years for newlyweds we had the pandemic and all that stuff as well but we spent a year developing the scripts mm. as well before i was ready to start auditioning then the pandemic hit but then i still wasn't 100 percent happy with the script so i knew i'd have rehearsals to flesh it out and table reads and really get to the nitty-gritty of it because writing and directing is all about rewrites and it's all about rehearsals and really going back to it to really get it to the point because people don't realize is that you could be on set right i used to do this when i was a runner yeah, like, you'd have the exec producer, like, calling and saying, yeah, I don't like this anymore. We need to cut that out. So you'd have the script editors, like, literally in their booth changing stuff. And then literally <laughs> they'd send an email to a production team and then they'd say, okay, you need to go and literally run and take this Adjustments. downstairs. Literally, these amendments, I literally had to run downstairs to the studio. <laughs> and then the dirty looks I used to get from everybody. They used to really? be like really again like i'm like it's yeah. not my fault and they're like we understand but it's like literally just for so wow siri just interrupting wow that's really professional <laughs> my apple watch <laughs> that's why technology yeah technology. exactly literally yeah literally just before they were about to shoot a scene i had to hand them the new amendments to say like these lines have been changed so this is how it goes like literally right to the end so when people like 
I won't say criticize, but they give their opinions on stuff. It's like there's so much work into this. So it's like always just congratulate somebody for actually just getting the job done. Because hey, look, you know I, how hard it is. A hundred percent. And I say to, you know, a lot of friends that don't work within this industry, try to find um, the great things you love about a movie that you don't actually love. Yep. So if, if it's a film that you may dislike, you come out of a film and you say, oh, I thought that was that was crap. Well, did you enjoy anything about it? Did you enjoy the fashion? Did you enjoy the music? Did you enjoy, enjoy the framing? It's because there's so much detail, like you said. You, I mean, you've just explained it for itself and it's like, there's got to be something. There's yeah. got to be, there's so much hard work being done, so much re so much... Um, and it takes its toll mentally and physically. It is, you know, it's the same as um, it's a different form of work. Yeah. It's, 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 I don't want to say it's, I don't want to compare it to a nine to five or say it's more than a nine to five or less than nine to five, but it's the amount of effort that goes into the creation of a film is unbelievable. Yeah. unbelievable and it, it deserves to be commended whether an audience likes the projects or not because that's the thing with me i'm the worst person to ask like oh what do you think of this film or that film unless it's like awfully bad <laughs> like if it's like really bad like then i'll be like okay that was terrible but like yeah. i can watch a film and appreciate it for what it is yeah you know and i get that this is for a specific audience so it's gonna entertain that audience and it's found the right audience for it so yeah. i can just appreciate it for what it is so yeah. when i watch stuff that's how i view things i'm mm. never looking at it like oh well this could be this and that could be that because everything is subjective anyway 100 so what you would have done isn't what somebody else would have done because that's their story so mm. that's how i always look at it 100 so yeah so what's next what else can you share is coming up in terms of in terms of directing it's it's all stag okay. um and it's it's so weird that you were talking about growth because it's just that idea of when I started um, the idea for this project and present it to Joe, even when I present it to yourself, I've, been, I've very much become a why person over these last couple of months. And I've, I've always I've been figuring out why am I trying to make this film? Why do I want to make this film? I think that's a really important question that any creative should ask themselves, why do they want to be a part of this project? And one of the first things that came to me was it the idea of ho the horror genre. I'm a fan of the horror genre. I'm a big fan, but it also scares me. It is also when I watched, I remember I watched The Shining the first time when I was, a, I don't know, I think I was 12 years old and my parents had gone out and it was just me and my brother and we were watching The Shining. And I just remember shitting myself i just remember being so frightened um and it's not necessarily just the only thing that i want the audience to have when they watch stag but i also want them to um know what their you know what is their perception of these characters what is their perception of you know the story the themes but going back to you know my why it's the idea of it's uncomfortable and I felt like I've had this journey on many a tr projects, including Finale, making a film during the pandemic. These situations aren't always easy. And I like to embrace something that almost scares me and challenge it head on. And then there's also the idea of the audience and, you know, the horror community, which I love, the, com the film community um, and, and the community of film in general. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, it, Stag is what is taking up my attention um, with regard to, I mean, it being a feature, it's just the idea of, I feel like if it was a short, then maybe there would be other projects that I've got on the go. But right now it's, 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 everything's just on Stag at the moment. And yeah, I can, I mean, how I continue to own my craft is working with screen actors and working with different scripts and reading different scripts and reading a lot of different books but yeah it's just it's just stag at the moment yeah nice and where can people find you and your previous work yep so you um i've just relaunched uh -huh. my new website which i spent hours on um so um anthonyvander.com 
um, socials, Anthony Vander, twi- Twitter, Anthony Vander, um, my production company, Distortion Entertainment, Distortion N on Twitter, uh, Distortion Movies on Instagram. So, yeah. Yeah, and you can watch Sweet Boy on Amazon Prime. Yeah, yeah. and Spa and uh, a couple of others. Yeah. Great. So just search Anthony Vander in Amazon Prime too. So <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Well, thanks yeah. again, Anthony, for coming on. It was really fun talking to you about your journey and everything else you got going on. So yeah, so thanks guys for tuning in. Stay tuned for new episodes coming soon. You can follow me all of my user socials. You know what they are. Just type in my name. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate it,